Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Iowa City Foreign Relations Program featuring Sakaus Nobis on this, the 2nd of November, and the start of Native American Heritage Month. Thank you for joining us in person and also via live stream today. My name is Peter Gerlach, and I'm the Executive Director of the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council, and I'll be your host today. I'd like to tell you that this year we're celebrating our 40th anniversary as an organization. We have some great plans this year with a total of four events devoted to celebrating our supporters, our legacy in the community, and the bright future ahead for internationally focused programming. We'll help, we hope that you'll check out our website, uh, sign up for our monthly newsletters, and follow us on social media to learn more about the exciting stuff happening this year. ICFRC wants to acknowledge and thank its annual donors, sponsors, and partners for this support. This list includes the Iowa Arts Council through the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs, Humanities Iowa, and the National Endowment for the Humanities, the University of Iowa's International Programs, Honors Program, and Public Policy Center, the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization, Midwest One Bank, Taxes Plus, City Channel 4 for providing online access to all of our programs along with the UI Library Archives. The Iowa City Public Library, which is our new home for programming this, this year and going forward. And uh, last but certainly not least, the long-standing support from individuals who have helped our organization for 40 years. Many of you are in the audience today. Thank you. ICFRC has adopted the Native American Land Acknowledgement prepared for the City of Iowa City's Ad Hoc Truth and Reconciliation Commission and Human Rights Commission. ICFRC recognizes that our home community of Iowa City now occupies the homelands of Native American nations to whom we owe our commitment and dedication. The full text of ICFRC's acknowledgement is on our website at icfrc.org. I would now like to introduce our speaker. Sakawas Novus is Plains Cree, I have to pronounce uh, Salto. Salto, thank you, of the George Gordon First Nation in Saskatchewan, Canada, and grew up in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, and is the founder and executive director of Great Plains Action Society. She has a master's degree in religious studies and graduate minor in native studies from the University of Iowa. In 2021, she received the Impact Through Advocacy Award from the Iowa Environmental Council. In June 2022, her dedication to the 2SLGBTQIA plus community earned GPAS the One Iowa Community Partnership Award. In March 2023, her work earned Great Plains Action Society recognition for being a woman-led organization doing excellent work in the realm of sustainability from the Johnson County United Nations Association chapter. Sakawas is also a commissioner on the Iowa City Truth and Reconciliation Commission. She also sits on the Midwest Environmental Justice Grant Advisory Committee, the Centering Equity in the Sustainable Building Sector Governance Team, and the Just Transition Power Force as a guest expert working to reduce harmful practices in corporate procurement processes. Please help me in joining Sakawas Nobis, who will talk about border imperialism control of land and bodies through colonial violence. Thank you. I didn't know you were going to do my whole bio. <laughs> um, I appreciate the, the invitation. Uh, I'm really glad to be here and uh, was actually kind of uh, excited to hear uh, that uh, this organization exists and uh, that you wanted to hear about the issues that we face uh, as indigenous peoples concerning borders because that's something that honestly isn't really talked a lot about but yet is one of our biggest issues here uh, in the U.S. and Canada and actually around the world. Uh, you know indigenous peoples have been uh, pushed off their land and controlled by borders uh, but are you know basically protecting 80 percent of the world's biodiversity still. So uh, to talk about borders is actually a very important um, 
subject, a really important thing to do. And so I'm actually going to start off by reading you uh, a intervention I gave uh, at the uh, United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues in 2019 on uh, border imperialism. And I shouldn't say that I gave, that a group of us gave. It was a group of us uh, Indigenous folks from around the world that wrote this. Uh, there was uh, five of us in the group. Um, and uh, so we, 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 you know, we talked about the things that connect us as Indigenous peoples uh, in terms of our culture and our language, but then also uh, the issues we face, and, and one issue we all face is border imperialism. Um, and so I'm going to uh, read this because I think it does a good job of contextualizing uh, what we're here to talk about, and then um, just talk about my experiences and, and, and uh, thoughts and some information uh, about borders. Uh, in reference to the, um, you won't know what MRIP study is. Okay, so let's just hold on. Um, okay, so the colonization of lands and indigenous peoples all over the world has resulted in the placement of foreign borders upon territories uh, of indigenous peoples that indigenous peoples have inhabited since time immemorial. The results of these impositions adversarially affects the nationhood and identity of indigenous peoples everywhere. Colonial border policy enforcement coupled with settler state immigrant immigration laws are some key factors in eroding indigenous people's customs, traditions, and national identities through displacement, restriction of traditional movement, and ongoing encroachment on indigenous territories. In this regard, we highlight the following concerns. First and foremost, the U.S. government is enforcing strict border restriction policy on sanctuary-seeking Latin American indigenous peoples attempting to cross a border that cuts through territories where their ancestors have always traveled. This government is also aggressively removing many undocumented indigenous peoples already established in the country and forcing them into inhospitable prison camps. An alarming development is that babies and children are being taken from their families and held in separate prison camps with no idea of when they may be reunited with their families. This is clearly in violation of Article 7 of the UN uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, also known as UNDRIP. Second, while Indigenous peoples have a right to national, nationality as reflected in Article 6 of the UN Declaration, there are Indigenous peoples in different refugee camps across the globe that do not enjoy this fundamental right. The indigenous peoples fleeing from violence like Nuba in, Kakuman, in Kakuma and uh, Dadaab refugee camps in Kenya have lost their nationhood due to displacement. Finally, we draw your attention to border encroachment caused by mega projects of extractive industries. These projects do not recognize the territories of indigenous peoples and their respective borders and have, a devastated, have devastating impacts. In Brazil, illegal logging and agribusiness projects are encroaching on the borders of the 16 indigenous nations that live in Zingu indigenous parks and also the territory of the uh, Manchineri nation. In Africa, the Samburu people in Kenya are being forced to vacate their lands by the massive Eastern Africa infrastructure project called LAPSET. And so um, we go on to talk about um, the articles uh, that UNDRIP has that relates to these uh, atrocities and, uh, you know, de de declare that, you know, we need people to... Uh, intervene. The UN needs to intervene. The state needs to intervene in what's happening. However, the state is the problem uh, in a lot of these cases. And so, like I said, this was an intervention um, that we presented in 2019 at the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, which is held every year in New York City. And as you probably might well, you might think, oh, you might realize this. That's that's hard for a lot of people to get to, to New York City. It's an expensive place. Um, and so there's a lot of people from around the world that, you know, come from nations uh, where, you know, the U.S. dollar really outweighs their dollars um, that struggle to get there. But they do. And um, it's pretty, it's, a, it's, Oh, it's a pretty amazing sight to see. It's empowering. Uh, it's also very sad. It's, um, it's, it's a, it's something that I think that needs more attention. So, um, 
you know, what, what are border, like, what, what are, you know, what is border imperialism, right? Like, basically, like, what I, like, I like to imagine describing it, it's uh, us as indigenous peoples um, living our lives, and then all of a sudden, uh, just, you know, almost being, like, stamped upon um, with a completely new, uh, uh, like, geolo, uh, sorry, uh, map, you know, um, with with different uh, ways of defining the land, um, you know, different uh, placing us in in different areas that aren't necessarily our areas where we thrived, um, and um, causing a lot of violence uh, in that process. Uh, borders are absolutely, I would say, one of the most precarious places for an indigenous person to to uh, fight against. Uh, in my opinion, the state, these countries uh, are very, very, very dedicated to upkeeping their borders. And, and so if you defy these borders in any way, most people are faced with severe consequences. And not only are these borders policed by the state itself, but these borders are places that are also policed by, um, I would call settler vigilantes, um, colonial militias, uh, places where, you know, the, the people themselves um, uh, like are, are enforcing, you know, violent practices on indigenous peoples. Um, uh, they're also places uh, where violence just naturally arises uh, because of, of course, of conflict of like who can be where and, you know, who was here before and what was traditionally done and, you know, what is being done now by, you know, the colonial capitalist state. Um, so one of the biggest issues within, you know, borders is border towns. Um, border towns began as, you know, mining and military outposts. Like, you know, border towns began as, well, any town, honestly. Like, you know, because everywhere we are is stolen land. So border towns are just like, um, in particular now, though, places where, you know, uh, that are like on the edges of reservations, um, you know, uh, on the edges of like the Canadian and the Mexico border, um, like places where, you know, you could even consider places in Florida, like a border town where people from, you know, Cuba are trying to come in, you know, uh, because they're just trying to get a better life. Um, so uh, border towns begin as mining and military outposts established on the perimeters of reservations. Many are small towns, but others are growing cities like Albuquerque, Seattle, and Rapid City, uh, and Omaha, which isn't too far from here, because I'm going to talk about Omaha later. Today, there are often, they are often the site of police brutality, marked by workplace discrimination, extreme poverty, and a lack of housing and social services for Native people. Tribal jurisdiction is limited or non-existent when it comes to prosecuting civil and criminal offenses. So that was something that was written by um, High Country News, uh, and I think that does a great job of describing uh, what a border, border town is. Um, you know, and then also uh, back to border imperialism, like I just want to uh, describe what a reservation is, right? So a reservation was initially uh, a place that was determined uh, for indigenous peoples to be moved to um, because they, you know, the, the state wanted to get them out of the way. They wanted them, you know, uh, secluded. They wanted them somewhere else. Um, and, and they were actually more like internment camps than they were, you know, like a haven for indigenous peoples. Um, they were usually uh, built or created on like bad land, like land that wasn't uh, very fruitful. Um, they, you know, usually weren't located in, um, you know, the nicest of places. And, uh, you know, a good example right now, because it's really popular, is Killers of the Flower, Mo Flower Moon. Is that what it's called? Yeah, I always forgot the name of it. Um, that just came out, that movie, because that's... Um, 
essentially about like uh, indigenous peoples being moved on to what was considered really you know, terrible land, uh, which turned out to be, you know, oil territory. And then at one point, these people became the richest folks in the world. Right. And then what happened? And then everybody was flocking to them again, because that's what colonial capitalists do. Right. It's all about greed. It's all about getting what you can, taking what you can from not just the people, but the land. And I'll, I won't go into that. But um, so that's that's essentially like what a reservation is, and it has borders, right? I mean, uh, indigenous peoples at first uh, had to ask the BIA agent, you know, if they could leave the reservation. You know, that's why they say, like, um, isn't there that saying, like, get off the reservation or you're, you're too far off the reservation or some saying like that, um, which is actually pretty racist. Uh, and, you know, like, again, in this movie, Killers of the Flower Moon, um, I've heard that, you know, they did a good job of showing how uh, indigenous peoples had to ask you know, how they could spend their money or what they could spend it on. And so um, within these borders was a lot of control and containment of people, of indigenous peoples. Um, and so, you know, uh, what these borders do also, like, uh, at the, uh, the, the, you know, Canadian and, well, let's just talk more about the Mexican border. Um, that big, I, 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 I picture that one to be like a big, big line, you know, like a big thick one, like written with a Sharpie, you know, it's very, very strict. Um, is it's, it's cutting off indigenous peoples from traditional migration routes. Um, it's, it's cutting off people that uh, used to, you know, travel from, you know, all the way down to Peru, all the way up to you know, northern Canada. People that, like, we, we had um, our wonderful uh, trade routes and, you know, we had our, our highways, if you will, and um, our routes that just, you know, people followed. Um, and, you know, that's, that, they, that was completely cut off with the, Amer you know, the American border, with the Canadian border, with all these borders, these countries' borders. Um, and so now that people are being um, facing such hardship in their countries, largely due to colonial capitalist practices that are, um, that are spurred on by the U.S., they're trying to come here for a better life. And this is actually more in their right to be here than anybody else than anybody else in the world. These people coming from south of the border have like a traditional, absolutely fundamental right to be in these lands because they used to come here all the time. And we used to go there all the time. And so that's what this border is doing. It's cutting off traditional migration routes. It's cutting off nationhood in, in Canada, for instance. Um, some of our tribes there, like... Um, the Haudenosaunee, um, you know, like they, they live on both sides of the border. And I mean, that's just a real, you know, uh, I mean, difficulty to deal with, right? You have to have a special card and you have to have like, you know, uh, you know, and you can get like f much greater fines or much greater jail time or, you know, like you're just, you're going to be um, facing, you know, uh, f more police brutality, um, and speaking of greater jail time, uh, indigenous peoples, we deal with the federal government. So anything that happens on a reservation is considered a, a federal issue. So that means that if you, you know, commit a crime, it's a federal crime, uh, which means you go to a federal prison, which means that you um, face longer jail times, which means that it's considered, you know, um, a worse of a crime, even though it's the same thing that you could be doing uh, in the city. Um, and so borders also increase, you know, our uh, rates of uh, incarceration uh, and and higher penalties for indigenous peoples as well. Um, so I um, let me see. I'm just going to how do I do this? Oh, <laughs> sorry. So um, that is me. Presenting the, that isn't the exact intervention. I'm going to talk about this intervention after. Uh, but that, that's me at the UN. Um, and uh, this is what it looks like when you're presenting an, an intervention. It has a mic just like this, actually. Uh, and, uh, you know, these are indigenous folks that are standing with me. I don't know if you recognize um, LaDonna. Um, uh, how did I just forget her last name? Um, anyways, LaDonna. Uh, 
she was one of the uh, founders of the Standing Rock movement, and unfortunately she passed away uh, a few years ago. But um, these are all very strong, powerful indigenous peoples that are standing with me, that have been doing a lot of work um, in all sorts of realms. And so I want to talk about um, this next. Uh, this is a conference that I was at, um, geez, 2017, I believe. And um, it was in Minneapolis. And uh, there was a, an amazing array of folks talking about different issues with borders. Um, and I haven't seen it, you know, happen since. And I really do hope it happens again. Um, because, like, I, I really learned a lot when I was there. Um, you know, I was actually really uh, excited to uh, listen even to uh, this one particular presentation uh, that talked about Japanese internment camps that were housed within uh, reservation lands. I mean, like, to me, that was like, wow, my, kind of mind-blowing. Borders within borders within borders. Um, and, and how, you know, that, that unfolded. Um, and so um, it was a really, uh, really great um, conference and maybe something one day, if you, you guys might be interested in hosting something like this because um, this is really related to foreign relations, right? Borders are absolutely the pinnacle of uh, foreign relations, if you, if you ask me. Um, and so I want to also talk next about um, this uh, right here. This uh, group, um, Culture Hack. Uh, I've been working with uh, Culture Hack Labs now for, um, I guess, since July. Um, I got picked to be part of a, a national cohort of Indigenous peoples. Uh, there's 25 of us or 30 of us um, from Central, um, South, and North America, from uh, Puerto Rico, Guam, uh, Kauai, uh, South Africa. And uh, we've been uh, creating narratives uh, about our land, where we come from, uh, and then combining these narratives and trying to create uh, a new narrative um, that exemplifies or like really uh, gets home the message uh, about undoing, um, you know, um, the theft of land, um, about getting land back, about re rematriating land. Rematriate means kind of the same thing as land back, but um, also can be defined as uh, putting land back to how it should be. So like rematriating the prairie, um, getting the buffalo back on the prairie. Um, it also is about empowering the feminine because I will say this, like everything that's happening is because of the toxic patriarchy. Um, the, the, you know, the colonial, colonial capitalism brought with it a toxic patriarchy. And we're, we're sitting at the precipice of a climate crisis right now because of that very reason. And I think if women around the world, we'd be so much better off. Um, <laughs> and, and so, um, we, uh, We've been uh, working on these these projects. Um, you know, uh, ours our group's project was about uh, um, debt, and you know, people living like and 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 owning land, and like just kind of how we are defined by debt. Um, and uh, this does come back to the border issue again because uh, the whole idea of um, this, this group that, you know, that, and what we're working on together is really about, like, getting the land back to Indigenous peoples. Um, liberating the land is another way to look at it. Maybe it's not just getting the land back to Indigenous peoples, but, like, liberating land that is just so unhealthy um, and healing that land. Uh, and uh, transitioning... You know, um, you know, from this this idea of ownership of land uh, to something else, which I know is very hard for a lot of people to imagine. Um, but before, oh, and I wish I would have put this slide in here. But before, uh, you know, we had uh, this issue uh, with land ownership. You know, indigenous peoples were very, very quite confused. Actually, you know, they were like what are you talking about? Like, I'm going to trade you this for this piece of land. You know, I think, and that's why you hear these jokes about indigenous peoples trading like 
a small amount of things or a small amount of money for land because like for them that just wasn't really a concept for us it was land is something you don't you don't uh, buy or sell it's just there and yes we do have our territories people did have their their places and yes they did fight you know over like you know who was where but it doesn't didn't necessarily mean that that person owned the land it just meant that that's where they were they were you know at that time um and so there's a really great quote and i like i said i wish i'd put this slide up um but it's a, uh, it's by piao piao mox mox who was walla walla and in 1855, he said, uh, goods on the earth are not equal. Goods are for using on the earth. I do not know where they have given land for goods. And so that quote, like, always really um, hits me, like, really hard because, you know, he's, he's trying to understand, like, um, you know, how, how people can possibly, like, imagine, like, that you can just trade the earth and i think that's a really powerful uh notion to keep in mind and so that's basically what this is all all about so they actually brought us to costa rica um in august and uh we spent seven days there together um working on our projects and we're still working on them as we speak um, but um, I think this is a really powerful uh, group of folks, and um, I'm excited to be working with them. An offshoot uh, from this is that myself and um, three other women have been chosen to uh, be in a think tank, if you will. Um, I don't know what else you'd call it. Uh, to uh, work with um, lawyers from around the world and uh, other uh, uh I guess, funders, if you will, like to try to put together a framework for land back. Um, so again, yes, this is all about border imperialism because the land is, I mean, when you think about it, it's 98% of agricultural land in this country is owned by white people. And sorry if I'm offending anybody, but like white people don't know how to farm. And like, that's just the the true that's this, just the true uh, reality of the situation because if they did know how to farm Iowa wouldn't be in the place that it is right now Iowa is the most biologically colonized state in the country um, Iowa is the number one contributor to the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico Iowa's cancer rate is like sky high I believe it's like second in the country right now in terms of rising cancer rates um, why is that because um, white colonial capitalist farming practices are, you know, very, very uh, linked to pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, fertilizers, monocropping, uh, GMO, um, you know, uh, just high yield farming, you know, like just turning that over and over and over, you know, as quickly as you can. Um, so we're now to a point where, you know, in some places in Iowa, the soil used to be as deep as nine feet, and now we're up to inches, and the UN says we have only 60 harvests left, and all that soil is just being washed off because, well, monocropping is, you know, shallow root plants like a crop, like a corn and soy, so there's nothing to hold on to the soil anymore because all that beautiful tall grass prairie and those beautiful roots are gone. Um, uh, and, and so we're losing everything into our waterways, which eventually end up in the Mississippi River, which eventually end up downstream uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, leading to more uh, of their natural disasters, actually, um, because they're facing a drought right now and salt water is inflowing now into the Mississippi uh, River area. And obviously, uh, there's not a lot of water that can get through all of the sediment buildup, which is our soil. It's like, it's so connected, right? And um, do borders matter in this case? I mean, does the border matter, right? No, it doesn't. Um, and I'll, uh, actually, maybe I'll move up a little bit about that. Um, because Iowa is the only nation, or sorry, the only state in the nation that is bordered by the two, two of the nation's mightiest rivers, the Missouri and the Mississippi rivers. So it's really unfortunate that Iowa is a uh, um, big egg sacrifice zone, is uh, a place where, um, you know, land is basically just fodder for 
agribusiness, and not even just agribusiness, but honestly, like the the type of farming that that colonizers colonizers brought into this land is why we're in this predicament in the first place. Because what is the first thing that they did between the 1830s and 1860s was they just completely tilled everything, and they 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 killed they killed the tall grass prairie, they killed the oak savannas, they killed the woodlands, they killed anything that like you know was naturally here um and uh we ended up with like just this really uh barren place that used to be as uh biologically diverse as an amazon rainforest and now is as biologically diverse as a as a desert so um and and then unfortunately because uh two of the greatest nations rivers are like bordering our state then everything that happens here ends up in those waters and is brought downstream uh, to other places where other people are suffering from the consequences of what we're doing. Um, so I, I just think that's really important. I don't think a lot of people realize that. They're like, wow, our borders really are the rivers, you know? Um, and I just, uh, I think that's really important. Uh, recently, uh, I actually... Uh, after years of working on this project, was able to procure the funding uh, to put together um, a uh, Mississippi River Summit where we brought folks from the headwaters down to the Gulf of Mexico, uh, all BIPOC folks, black, brown, indigenous folks, to uh, talk about um, all the issues they're facing or the projects they're carrying out uh, in terms of the river and 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 everything that the river uh, brings with it, right? And so, for instance, uh, we had uh, an, an Anishinaabe person, Jessica Engelking, talk about uh, rights of nature for wild rice uh, up at the headwaters. We had folks from Bovancha, which is the native word for New Orleans, uh, the Bovancha Collective, talk about um, you know, the unfortunate issues they're facing in the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. We had folks from um, Rye St. James uh, talk about Cancer Alley. Um, folks from Memphis talk about um, uh, pipelines that they're fighting. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Lance Foster, uh, the tribal historian of the uh, Iowa tribe uh, came and talked about rights of nature for the Missouri River that they're working on and how that can be applied as well to um, the uh, Mississippi River, which was the point of this uh, summit, actually, uh, because the summit was to get the people together. Um, this was in May that we hosted this. And now we're working towards a coalition, a Mississippi River rights coalition, hopefully to work towards... Um, Oh, sorry. hopefully to, I thought, I was like, what is that? Um, hopefully to, to the, the ultimate goal is to get rights of nature for the Mississippi River. Um, and that's going to be difficult because that will involve a lot of borders. So it'll, be, it'll involve a lot of states getting involved and, you know, but, but that's our goal. Uh, rights of nature basically means recognizing that an entity has like almost the same kind of rights that a, a human does. Um, and so the Mississippi River right now is very sick. It's the most polluted river in the nation. And, um, and she really needs our help. And, you know, we, we need to look at her as a relative, just like we do, um, you know, uh, like other, and as indigenous peoples, we also look at other beings as relatives, you know, like the buffalo um, or the salmon right now. Folks, indigenous folks are working on getting rights of nature for the salmon. Um, just like I said, folks are working on getting rights of nature for the wild rice um, in uh, northern Minnesota. So um, that's my little spiel about borders in Iowa. Um, so I talked about border towns earlier. Um, and border towns bring with them a specific kind of, you know, violence. Um, sometimes it's, uh, it's, oh my goodness, let me, let me explain this. It's, it's, it's a, there's, there's a kind of, I guess, understanding there maybe that like there's less rules, Right. Um, and 
in essence, there kind of is because uh, the United States has never really figured out how to deal with indigenous peoples in a legal way. Um, there's like a, kind of this black hole or this gray area when it comes to <clears throat> crimes carried out on reservations, uh, meaning that sometimes people get away with things because there's like people, people are not sure which jurisdiction the crime falls under. So, um, there's a, there's a fight to, to end that. Um, the violence against women act actually has uh, a piece of legislation in it that, you know, says that, um, you know, on our reservations now we can start, um, holding people responsible that create like a violent, uh, crime, like a sexual assault or, or a rape, you know. Um, but still, that's not really, you know, happening. Um, and and so there's like a, a lot of like, a, um, I guess, people taking advantage of the situation, people taking advantage of indigenous peoples who, yes, are definitely vulnerable. We are vulnerable populations because we are still uh, basically dealing with our post-apocalyptic world, our genocide, right? And there's a lot of uh, healing that has to go on. So there's a lot of drug and alcohol abuse. There's a lot, we have the highest rate of missing and murdered people in the country. Um, and, and so border towns are places where people kind of take advantage of the situation. White Clay is a really good example in Nebraska uh, that was right next to the Ogallala Nation, and it was literally on the border, and I think it sold something like three million cans of beer a year. Um, like, it was there for years and years and years. And there's a, a, a movie you should watch called Sober Indian, Dangerous Indian, and it features Frank Lemire, who was, like, one of the leading uh, people in the... In the uh, um, in the cause to shut down uh, alcohol sales in White Clay, because you know Pine Ridge Res or Ogallala Pine Ridge Reservation, um, they they are like it, it's a dry reservation, um, but they were taking advantage of that these these like you know uh, colonizers by setting up shop right next to the reservation to sell alcohol to Native people that obviously we're dealing with like a lot and. Um, so there, that's a perfect example of a border town um, and the kind of harm that is implemented. Um, you know, there's Standing Rock, uh, which was a huge deal. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people here know about it because the Dakota Access Pipeline goes through Iowa. Um, these are some pictures I took uh, when I was there um, of, like, uh, us trying to hold off cops from coming into unceded treaty territory. Those are... Uh, <laughs> Those are uh, trucks that some folks uh, burned uh, to create a, you know, a blockade. Um, and those, that's barbed wire that the cops put up. So um, I, don't know what the, I don't know what was going on. They either wanted us to leave or not leave. It was very confusing. Um, and um, so this is on unceded treaty territory, which is another, which falls into our conversation about borders, which is like land that's never been like rightfully ceded over to the government. So it's kind of like in limbo. Um, and uh, this is where all of this was taking place. And so I just wanted to show you like how intense a fight to protect our land and our water and whatever it is that we want to protect can get and how the governments never actually respect our borders, but they will ha gleefully, happily put borders upon us and restrictions upon us as indigenous peoples. Um, and then um, I want to talk about uh, Zachary Bearhills. Um, he um, was murdered in uh, 20... 17, uh, 17, I think, yeah. And, uh, on June 6th in Omaha, um, he was walking, um, in Omaha, which is considered a border town. Um, and it has high rates of violence against black and brown and indigenous folks there. And, uh, he was kicked off a bus cause he had, was off of his medication. He's schizophrenic and he was talking to himself so the driver kicked him off for talking to himself. And he walked 90 blocks uh, to like a gas station. And it was really hot out that day. It was like 100 degrees. And he went into a gas station to um, get some help and started to lick the, the condensation on the 
glass because he was so thirsty. And so the, the clerk called for help, not the cops, but to have help. And the people that initially showed up actually were people that were there to help him with his mental health crisis. But other cops soon showed up and violently murdered him um, in a way that is like just just like the George Floyd uh, incident. Um, you know, they were uh, they tased him 13 times. They punched him. They dragged him by his gra- braids, um, which is. To me, that that right there is a hate crime in and of itself, because, um, of course, indigenous men have braids and to drag them by it is like um, uh, very um, telling of how these people felt about indigenous peoples, in my opinion. Uh, And so uh, uh, our our organization, Great Plains Action Society, um, we've been marching uh, with him and with his family and uh, ever since... um, and so this is, these are some pictures. That's his mom in the middle. Uh, that's every year she puts up a, you know, a shrine to him. Um, these are folks that came down from, came up from Oklahoma, actually. Um, and that's one of, that's, uh, that was my youth um, organizer there, Alexandria. And um, so every year we, we uh, basically um, have this uh, walk and vigil, prayer walk and vigil from the bus stop to the, a uh, place where uh, he was murdered, um, and it's very hard. It never gets easier, um, and so that's an example of um, you know what happens in in border towns. Uh, High Country News wrote, Bear Hill's story is part of the violent legacy of Indian country's border towns. The towns and cities outside Indian reservations, where Indigenous and white residents live side by side. So. Um, and, you know, Zachary Bearhills is just, you know, one of many uh, in this country, um, depending on the year, most years, Indigenous peoples have the highest rate of uh, police murder um, above everybody else. But that's just not something that people know a lot about because we face so much erasure um, and there's not a lot of, um, you know, information about that. Um, and then I want to talk about man camps quickly. Um, and then I'll have some time for questions. Uh, so part of living, um, in Indian country is dealing with man camps, which kind of create like their own kind of little border town, if you will. Man camps, um, are temporary workforce housing, um, situations that are created for, uh, workers to come in, trans, tra- like, uh, uh, transient workers to come in to, like, build, um, like, a large project, like a pipeline or to mine or to whatever. Um, and I, I gave an intervention on this as well, and I'm going to read you uh, just a, a little excerpt of this intervention at, that I gave at the UN. Um, the relentless colonization of our territories has a direct correlation to an increased rate of violence against indigenous peoples, in particular women and uh, two-spirit folks. We have many names for this crisis, one of which is missing and murdered indigenous relatives. Our focus here is on the effect uh, that temporary workforce housing for large construction projects, fossil fuel extraction, or mineral mining has on indigenous communities situated nearby. As James Anaya has stated, indigenous women have reported that the influx of workers into indigenous communities as a result of extractive projects has also led to increased incidents of sexual harassment and violence, including rape and assault. Um, Here we highlight the following two examples. A study in Canada examining the potential impacts associated with the Mount Milligan mine in British Columbia on the Niklasdi and the Tlazdan First Nations. It was found that the local community experienced a 48% increase in assaults with a weapon, uh, a 50% 50 increase in aggravated assaults, a 38% increase in sexual assaults, a 37% increase in missing uh, uh, people's reports. According to a report released in 2017, there is also a correlation between an increase of violence and, uh, and the Bakken oil boom. On the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation in North Dakota, located in the middle of the Bakken oil fields, there has been a 70% increase of federal case filings between 2009 and 2011. Um, the report states that since the boom, Native American communities have 
reported increased rates of human trafficking, specifically sex trafficking and missing and murdered Indigenous women in their communities. So that's very important as well. I don't know if I mentioned this, but there is very much a high rate of sex trafficking that goes on um, uh, in, you know, around our borders, on our reservations. Um, and uh, that, that happens you know, uh, even during hunting season, um, if you can believe that, in South Dakota, it's, you know, there are statistics that prove that there's an increased rate of sex trafficking during hunting season. Um, and this isn't necessarily about borders, but like, uh, you know, if, you know uh, games, big sports games, there's increased trafficking there. Um, and there's a lot of trafficking that goes on across the Canadian and the U.S. border, um, specifically where I'm from in Winnipeg. Um, where uh, the amount of Native women that are in the sex trafficking, that are being trafficked, um, are Indigenous, uh, as close to uh, 50% of the people being trafficked are Native. Um, and then lastly, I just want to say the University of Iowa did me a solid um, a long time ago when I came here to get my master's degree, um, or my PhD, actually. Um, and they gave me a uh, presidential dean scholarship presidential scholarship um, for a four-year ride here with everything paid for, um, even though they'd never given that to a non-citizen before, uh, but they gave it to me because they recognized my indigeneity and the fact that Cree folks, you know, have been cut off by that border, the Canadian border. So, and that was like a while back. So like, I just want to say kudos to the university for um, not recognizing that border and for recognizing uh, indigeneity first. So, um, uh, yeah, that's all I have to say. Uh, thank you. I had a microphone, but I put it down somewhere. <laughs> oh, there it is. I think, oh, yeah. Okay, very good. Um, we now move to the question and answer portion of the program. Uh, for those with a question, please raise your hand, and I'll bring the microphone to you. Uh, before we begin with those questions, ICFRC wants to thank our supporters and donors for their support. If you would like to join our organization or make a gift to support our programs, like this excellent program today, please go to icfrc.org or take a look at the sign here posted in front. Uh, Folks, do you have questions? Just check it. Okay. There you go. Oh, even better. Thank you. Okay. Anyone with a question? There's a lot to unpack here. Yes. Let me come around to you. And we're using the microphone in part because we are recording this uh, event, and so folks can hear us even better with the recording and for posterity. Thank you. Thank you so much. I was wondering if there are, you talked about interventions, but they sounded like there were more community or nationwide. Are there any interventions that are going on to help the individual persons that are being impacted so severely? Um, no, I've never heard of a, or I mean, I'm not like an expert uh, at the UN, um, but when I was there, I, I don't seem, it doesn't feel like people would necessarily represent want an intervention on just one person. Like, you're there to talk about your community and your nation, usually. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I wish I knew more about the UN. Yeah, I, was, I guess I was just wondering, uh, from my nursing background, we focused on interventions, and so it just seemed like some of the group work that could possibly be done by individuals, um, not to focus on one, just one individual, but to focus on maybe individuals within um, a particular border area to facilitate them, to provide, to empower them to some degree. Thank, thank you very much. I, I learned a lot, and I very much appreciated uh, the information and the perspective you presented, which shows how the UN provides a platform or a forum for groups like indigenous peoples that have never had uh, that platform before. 
And I was wondering if you could uh, share with us what reaction do you get from the member states at the UN when you make these interventions? Do they, do they comment back? No, um, I don't think, I don't even know if they're allowed to comment back. It's very, um, very bureaucratic. Yeah. You know, um, you have your three minutes and, you know, you have to do everything in the right order. You have to have your hand raised and then you have to remember to press the button. And, and if you don't do that, then too bad. Um, and they'll cut you off at three minutes. Um, they won't let you finish even like your last word. Um, and I don't, they, they don't have time to respond necessarily. I think at the end of like a, a certain block, they might have some response um, of the people that are up, the delegates that are up representing that, that, that year. Um, and yeah, I, I love the UN as a place to get across these important issues so you can elevate what it is that you're trying to talk about. But in the end, I always wonder like, all these inter inter interventions, these thousands of interventions that come through, like I feel like they just end up in a pile, you know, somewhere, a stack of paper, and then that's it, you know, because the UN doesn't actually have any like legal domain here, you know, like the U the, the United States does not recognize the UN's, uh, you know, uh, declarations as um, any, any any any, you know, legally at all, so. Could, could I ask a related question? Among, are you aware among the UN member states, are there some some governments that are more sympathetic to your your points? Yeah, of view? there are, um, and I believe even like the province of British Columbia has begun to adopt some of these recommend rec these sorry um, declarations, uh, uh, you know, legally. So there are people, uh, or there are nation states around the world that have adopted um, some of these declarations legally. I have to say that um, it was, it's really hard for me to understand um, non-ownership of land. And so a, a Navajo friend of mine said, yeah, we don't believe that you can own the land. And, you know, recently they uh, talked about this a bit on with regards to space, like when, when we went to the moon, they planted a flag. Mm -hmm. Well, nobody can own the moon, right? <laughs> or right, is the question mark. I don't know, Elon Musk might be uh, yeah. working that way. And the other thing, um, I was attracted to the, the title of your lecture because of controlling land and bodies. And I know that there are a lot of women that migrate from Mexico and South America. Is, it's one of the highest rate of rape on their way here. Mm -hmm. And also death, you know, in the middle of the desert. Uh, and then even uh, apparently our, one of our Supreme Court justices uh, did not allow a woman to get an abortion for quite a while. So... Uh, um, I don't know if you could talk about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, um, there is so much violence at that border. Um, the, you know, even the coyotes, like themselves, that are supposedly taking these people, um, are taking advantage of these people. And a lot of women get raped in that way as well. They get trafficked in that way. Um, there's like a tree. There's trees that have women's underwear in it um, that signify like just this woman was raped. Here's her underwear. I, um, this is true. I mean, I, I know this from firsthand, like talking to people firsthand about it. Um, and um, like, again, I'm going to talk about VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act. Um, it has increased protections in there for indigenous people, uh, for um, the LGBTQ community, also for migrant women, because um, they are aware, they, the United States is aware that migrant women faced very, you know, uh, high rates of um, uh, sexual assault and just, you know, uh, violence in general, um, because it's, it's um, they are, um, you know, a, a, they are definitely in, in a situation that they can be taken advantage of, right? Because um, if you're here illegally, what are you going to do? What recourse do you have? So 
that's definitely taken advantage of that border. Borders are just, to me, just like a, a places where um, places where violence thrives. I, I do have a question here from a, a viewer online. Would the granting of dual citizenship to indigenous peoples whose nation is violated by a colonialist border improve their life? Um, I mean, I, I think a lot of them, I mean, I can't, I don't know. I don't know if they do or not, but yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, I have, du I have dual citizenship. Um, I just got it last Thursday. <laughs> Congratulations. <So. laughs> um, but my country won't, doesn't recognize that my U S citizenship, but I think the U S recognizes the Canadian citizenship. But yeah, I mean, of course that would um, alleviate a lot of issues. But what we really should be doing is just like leaving these nations alone and like letting them govern their own borders in the way they want to govern them. That's, that's what we should be doing. Yeah. Thank you for sharing all these ideas and this history with us. Your um, Great Plains Action Society, um, I picked up on the word action. Those of us here in Iowa City, what action would you like to see us take? Or what could we do right here in Johnson County or Iowa City to um, help your movement? Um, so another word that's important there is society. So we're, we're a small group on purpose. Um, we're, we're trying to emulate the ways uh, that our ancestors did things, which was to work in small societies um, that uh, carried out a daily task or, uh, you know, were activated for, you know, an issue that might come up. Uh, and so we're just, we're a small group of indigenous folks across Iowa and eastern Nebraska um, working on climate and social justice issues. Um, so... It's, it's, we're not really a volunteer type of organization. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, but we would love your support, um, it, you know, showing up to our events like today. Um, and also a really exciting event that's coming up, I hope you all can come out to, is Truthsgiving. Um, we have that every year uh, for the past, geez, uh, seven years now, I think. Um, and I was doing it in my home way before that. Uh, it was just something I started doing uh, because I, I really like Thanksgiving and I wanted to, you know, cook the turkey and all that stuff, but I, you know, felt guilty. I'm like, why am I doing this? Like Thanksgiving, it's got such a horrible mythology behind it. It's like, it's perpetuating, you know, just like, you know, uh, stereotyping and it whitewashes the truth. And that's what this shirt is actually, uh, for the truth will not be whitewashed. It's partially for our, our truth giving work. And, um, I started calling it truth giving in my house. Uh, because I said, okay, we're gonna, ex we're still gonna like really enjoy the dinner and getting together and celebrating the harvest and eating indigenous foods, but we're, you know, we're gonna tell the truth, and so um, truth giving has become popular, and so now we've we were celebrating at the Engler um, last year and this year, and we have a band coming, an indigenous band, indigenous uh, and uh, Afro indigenous and just folks from all over the world. They're, they're amazing. They're called Audio Pharmacy. They're coming from California. We'll have drummers uh, from um, Winnebago Nation um, and speakers. Uh, I'll be speaking uh, with some folks. And um, it's like last year, I, like people just, they couldn't get over how amazing the night was. It was so much fun. Um, and so that's on November 10th. Um, and if you go to the Englert's uh, website, you can get a ticket. They're you can get a ticket for as cheap as five dollars. We're not we're not trying to make it cost prohibitive. So whatever you want to pay for a ticket, you can pay for a ticket. Um, and then of course, just like follow us online, sign up for our newsletter at the bottom of our website. Um, and just you know, it, uh, next year we'll be having Indigenous Peoples Day again. <laughs> it was our first year doing it with the city, and <laughs> yay! <laughs> um, and uh, through the the Parks and Recreation Department and the Human Rights Commission. Um, and I'm really excited about doing it again next year. Uh, and so please, you know, support that. Um, if you want to donate, you can donate through our website as well. Um, but again, like I said, like for me, the most important thing is like showing up to our events and supporting what we do in that way. 
Yeah, very good. Thank you so much, Sakaris. Uh, and an excellent talk today, and lots of things I think are very important for all of us to not only hear but to discuss. Um, this was ICFRC's ninth program of the fall. Our next program features Iyad Saeed speaking about surviving a dictator, a dictator surviving. Join us for that uh, from 6 to 7 p.m. on Wednesday, the 8th of November, right here in the Iowa City Public Library, where Saeed will ask timely questions such as, what happened in Syria since it stopped being a breaking news hot topic? How are the Syrian people surviving post-Civil War living conditions? Is Assad still at large? And why does all of this matter? With that, thank you again very much for joining us, and thank you so much, Sakalas. We are adjourned. You.